How's that? Is that any better? USA New Wave and ranked list authors not books that we'll focus on some specific books this is a sequel to the UK top 10 new wave and the UK anthologies new wave videos and there'll be more new wave to come the thing with new wave is that it's very subjective it's not about reaching some sort of Apollonian objectivity of a best so yeah this is clickbait but the whole point of new wave is to turn things on its head and to change the way you look at SF and that's what it did in the 1960s here we are 50 60 years later its repercussions still can still be felt in some ways they're fading away because of the way SF publishing has gone but that's for another time so we're going to talk about that today and the fact is is that new wave was really primarily a British phenomenon and if you watch the other videos you'll see that and if you look in the first edition of the SF Encyclopedia from the late 70s which won the Hugo Award a wonderful book the entry on New Wave in that I revisited it the other day for the first time in many years and it almost 90% focuses on the UK because that's when New Wave was born that's where the term was coined by Christopher Priest there was another usage early on about that time in an American zine as well and even though it was used in the USA it meant a different thing but it was a transatlantic thing because many important American SF writers of the new generation in the 60s came across to London to work on New Worlds, Michael Moorcock's magazine, the one he edited, which was spearheaded by the likes of J.G. Ballard and William S. Burroughs. They were the sort of figureheads, really, and Moorcock sort of edited it, then Charles Platt. And really, people came over from the states to work on it and um, to work with people like this wonderful British writer M. John Harrison and this is the double day first of his incredible space opera The Centauri Device from the mid 70s so he was a real pro stylist there's interviewed Mike on the channel and that's the sort of person that the Americans wanted to work in tandem with and the Americans who came over were people like Thomas M. Dish James Salas, Samuel R. Delaney, John Sladek. New It Worlds also published people like Zelazny and Harlan Ellison and others and other writers as well. Norman Spinrad came over. So there was a coterie of five or six of these people who lived in London and swinging London at that time. You know, this is the late 60s and things were really sort of pumping. And the social backdrop of the Vietnam War, psychedelic drugs, the pill, flower power rock and roll civil rights all these things they seem like cliches now but it was a time of real revolution and change and new wave was part of the counterculture new world's magazine became part of the counterculture in as much as an sf magazine so those guys came over so you'll see some repetition between the two but who should we start with well if we talk about american new wave we have to talk about the differences first of all and really the book which sums up the american new wave arguably and in theory is this book dangerous visions edited by harlan ellison and the main difference between us and uk new wave was in the uk it was very much about breaking down the walls between the mainstream and sf and bringing modernist literary techniques into science fiction making it more ambitious in the literary sense making it compete with general fiction and also the plan was to infect general fiction with fresh ideas and that came to fruition in the 80s and beyond and i see the veins of the new wave coursing through british literary culture now even when the writers themselves are not aware of it and they often don't know the legacy that they have is down to that and it was different in the states i mean in the uk you had there were some high profile trials early in the 60s the lady chatley trial Thirty years after Lady Chatley's Lover was published in Italy in a limited edition hardcover, because Lawrence's books used to be banned and burned in the UK, he had to go to Europe. Finally, Penguin issued it. There was a court case. It was judged not obscene, and it was a real sort of changing thing. You know, it was a time when it indicated how people were fed up with being pushed around by the fuddy-duddy 
old school and they wanted social change and they wanted aesthetic change as well. There were other high profile trials, another one was the one for Hubert Salby's last exit to Brooklyn. which initially lost twice in one on appeal. That's an important book, important writer. So, you know, things were changing and Britain was more permissive. The permissive society was there. And in theory, this was the case in the States as well. But as Christopher Priest pointed out in an interview on the channel, you know, America was more under the sort of the religious thumb. It's a much bigger country, much harder for anything underground to spread quickly across the country. And it was a good deal more conservative. So for writers like Harlan Ellison, and a lot of the people he championed, they'd had issues um, always in sort of being able to say what they wanted to say, particularly with reference to sex and gender and colour and issues like that, which are today's sort of identity politics things, which everybody thinks are new. If you know your SF, you know that they were tackled in the 60s and 70s big time. So they were trailblazers, people like Philip Jose Farmer and Theodore Sturgeon, who had looked at sex and gender questions and looked at the Freudian impulses beneath the surface of Pulp Fiction in the 50s and had got away with it so far. But really, writers were sort of fed up with being unable to sell material and to experiment freely. And Ellison decided to do this anthology, to give them a voice, to let them say whatever they wanted to say, to be outrageous, to be taboo breakers. Now, the fact is, is that when you look in Dangerous Visions, and you must get it, it's important. It's a big book. There's an awful lot of writers in there. And if you compare a lot of them to the UK New Wave writers, the fact is a lot of them were not experimental in a stylistic way at all. It was more about the content. And in a way, US New Wave was as much about iconoclasm and taboo breaking as opposed to literary experimentation. There was taboo breaking in the UK. If you read a story like I Remember Anita by Langdon Jones, for example, which is the first person narrative of a young man who is bemoaning, missing his girlfriend. He's at her grave and he's missing the great sex life they had. Um, she's been killed in a nuclear holocaust. <laughs> it really upset people at the time. You know, there isn't anything quite as ultra as that in here. And there's all sorts of people. You know, there are people who've been writing as far back as the 30s, like Robert Bloch. And there were people who used his political conservative, like Larry Niven. Philip K. Dick was in here. Philip K. Dick wasn't part of the new wave. He fostered it. He was from an old school. He was quite suspicious of a lot of the experimentation. But the younger people like Robert Silverberg, who'd done all sorts of writing, wanted to bring more sophistication into SF and had left the field for some time and was coming back at that point. The people like Aldis from the UK. Um, you know, Poole Anderson and Fritz Lieber are in here, you know, old school guys. But there were new writers like David R. Bench, John Sladek, R.A. Lafferty, who, you know, so it's a real mix of traditional people and people up and coming. And R.A. Lafferty's an interesting one. He's somebody who is often appended to the New Wave because he was very verbose. I see him more as being like a post or American fabulous, more like John Barth or John Gardner, somebody like that. And of course, he was politically conservative, Catholic, um, used to drink a heck of a lot. Very, very wild and strange. So he's new wave in a way, but quite different to a lot of the other writers. And one of the writers that I'm going to mention today is of Barry N. Malsberg. He told an anecdote about how Lafferty at a convention would, you know, would always get very drunk and he would walk around the room and talk to everybody. And Malsberg said, when he got to me, he said, Barry N. Malsberg, I haven't got a clue what you're writing about. And I think a lot of people feel that way with Lafferty as well. So this is a real mixed bag. The thing about this book is that Ellison was really, really good as a proselytizer. He was good with hyperbole. He was good at hype and he was good at talking himself up. He's primarily a fantastic short story writer and screenwriter. If you've never read Ellison, you really should. He's really important. There's an overview of my paperback collection coming up soon on the channel. And Ellison put this together. He trumpeted about it a lot, won lots of awards. You know, lots of good stories got into print. And, you know, I blow hot and cold about this. I think some of it is overrated. But what's brilliant in this is that Alison writes wonderful introductions, wonderful forwards and wonderful afterwards. So whenever I pick this up, I always find I read Ellison's work more than anybody else's, but he was also one of my first loves. But Ellison, in a way, was a better writer in terms of communicating with the public, in terms of getting his vision across than almost anybody in this book. 
And even though individual stories are better and individual writers are possibly more important than Alison, uh, Alison really summed up the spirit of it. So you have to have this. So um, I have read the introductions and the afterwards uh, more than I've ever read the stories. But there are some great stories in here. Probably my favourite story in this is by somebody who I really... <laughs> I don't know, he's easy to dismiss and he had a very big oeuvre, but he was seminally important um, in changing our stuff. And that's Philip Jose Farmer. This is a hardcover reprint of The Lovers. The Lovers was first published in the early 50s. And it's a story about um, a future Earth, which is very puritanical and a character who goes to another planet and he's being watched by a guy called Pornson, which tells you everything and to communicate with the, with the beings there. And basically, <laughs> he falls in love with this alien woman who is not quite what she seems. Um, so it's about interspecies sex. And Farmer was the sort of person doing that. And Farmer was wild and anarchic. And you just sort of had to love him, really. And he, he really sort of brought that thing, that kind of mature thing into it. And Rides the Purple Wage is in Dangerous Visions. And it won the Hugo Award in 1968. That's the little singleton of it. There's other stories in here as well. There was a quasi sequel called The Ooh Genesis of Bird City. It was never re novelized, thankfully, because Farmer was better in shorter forms than novels. He wrote a lot of routine adventure stories, very influenced by Edgar Rice Burroughs. I mean, they're great, they're great fun, but there's an awful lot of them. But his finest work are his parodies, his pastiches, and his short work, which is often outrageous and wild and anarchic. And, you know, this is about a utopian society, and it's written in a sort of penning style. So I like James Joyce. There's lots of literary allusions and playful language. If you like Lafferty, you'd like this. And it's about a young artist, rather like Joyce's Stephen Dedalus in Port of the Arts of a Young Man. And in Ulysses, who is making his way through this society, which is is utopian, and you can do almost anything, but it's kind of strictures as well. And the purple wage is like the dole, it's money you get, it's like universal basic income, to put it in the crudest possible terms. And the title is a reference to Zane Gray's Western um, Riders of the Purple Sage. Farmer himself wrote another story called Spiders of the Purple Mage. All these purple stories are collected in a book called The Purple Book, which is great fun to pick up. And, you know, it's a merging of high art and low in the gutter culture. It's quite scatological and sexy. And, you know, it's sort of um, excrement and gold mixed together. So, you know, it does, it does challenge you. And really, you know, he's this is him at his best, I would say. He's a real agent of chaos. So Rides the Purple Wage is in a lot of the farmer anthology, and it's also in this book. Um, other highlights in here include um, Flies by Robert Silverberg. There's also, um, let's see, there's a great Chris Neville story in here, which is fantastic. There's a David R. Bunch. Um, there's Carol M. Schwellers, Sex and or Mr. Morris, and she's somebody you don't hear much about. And this Sturgeon's If All Men Were Brothers, Would You Let One Marry Your Sister? And the implications of that. Sturgeon, like Farmer, was somebody who was a bit more frank about things. And there's people like Sonia Dorman, who was, you know, at the time was a writing star we never hear about now. Sladek, Lafferty, J.G. Ballard, Norman Spinrad's Carcinoma Angels and the very wonderful Samuel R. Delaney's Eye and Gomorrah, which I'll talk about again later. So this is your entry point. But you will see if you read this alongside, say, a New Worlds anthology, there's massive differences. Overall, if you took all the sort of British New Wave writers and compared them to these, you'll find a lot more experimentalism and a lot more awkwardness and difficulty because New Wave was about modernism and modernism was partially about embracing difficulty. Um, even though modernism sort of began arguably in literature in the late 19th century and its key high point according to the critics was the 20s and 30s with people like Virginia Woolf and James Joyce then really it, it was broader than that in Europe there were people like Kafka um, and Bataille lots of all sorts of interesting European writers and they went on a lot longer there's the existentialist Camus and Sartre and all this stuff fed into the new wave particularly the new world's UK school 
and some of it got over there. There's a number of cases where, like the Ballard story that was supposed to be in here, is different to the one that got in, and you know, and there's a lot. It, it's the history and hagiography of New Worlds and how it came together, how its sequel, again, Dangerous Visions, came together, and how its second sequel, The Last Dangerous Visions, didn't come together is huge, and I'll talk about those in another time on the channel. But that's kind of your starting point, really. You have to sort of begin there with that. So I'm going to start with somebody quite obscure who doesn't get a lot of attention and it's just going to be how these things come out and this is a book you can you can get it second hand um, I think I bought this about 20 years ago this is Times Hammers by James Salas now James Salas is American I think he's from the south I can't recall I haven't researched it and these days he is one of the most acclaimed crime writers in the world he's not a household name he's not a bestseller he's best known for writing the novel Drive which was made into a film by Nicholas Winding Refn about 10 years ago which is also the pink neon it's got Ryan Gosling in it great wonderful 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 electronic soundtrack um, by Cliff Martinez and Drive is um, about a stunt driver who you know acts he's got another life he's a stunt driver in Hollywood and in his other life he drives cars for people doing getaways from crime scenes and that's his most famous book But he began his life as a science fiction writer. He was mostly published in New Worlds. He did play stuff elsewhere, briefly acted, and he produced a book called A Few Last Words, which I've never seen a single copy of. And you can get it on ABE. There's none in the UK. I must pick one up because I've always wanted it. All those stories are in this, um, Times Hammers. This is from Toxic Press. Toxic were a short-lived company. They did some of Norman Spinrad's books as well and there's all kinds of things in this there are crime stories in this amazing stories and really he is very interesting he's very self-referential his crime stories are amazing they mostly feature a black protagonist and they often refer to themselves and they refer to him the writer so they're very postmodern, fourth wall breaking really really good they're quite sharp and short my favorite book by him is a spy novel um, called death will have your eyes which is fantastic But yeah, he's also been a poet, a translator, he speaks French, very influenced by the French new novel in the early 60s, late 50s. And this is a very pure and rarefied thing. And my favourite work by him is a Jerry Cornelius story called The Anxiety in the Eyes of the Cricket. And The Anxiety in the Eyes of the Cricket I first read in um, the new SF anthology. And it's just wonderful stuff. I'm just going to read you a little bit. Um, Afterwards, they sat together on the terrace patio smoking. Behind them on the steel slab, the house, with its forty rooms, separate as the chambers of a nautilus, stood like something grown up out of the hill. The steel extended several yards down into the grey ash-like soil, steel scaffolding still farther to the base rock. Jerry had just come from the east, with his arm torn loose from its socket and one eye half closed on itself. Passage was difficult these days. He had come on impulse. Jerry Cornelius is, I mentioned a few times, is one of Moorcock's fulcrum characters. He is one of the incarnations of the eternal champion, the one who's most conscious of that, more so than John Dacre, Eric Jose. And Jerry steps between realities, he changes sides, he is there to get the cosmic balance going. And he's a real hip character, you know, he wears a car coat, he's got long black hair, white skin, sometimes it turns black. He's an assassin, a rock star, Nobel Prize winning physicist, ex-Jesuit priest. And, you know, he was a template and the characters around were templates that lots of writers who wrote the New Worlds used. There's Norman Spinrad did one, M. John Harrison did some, Brian Aldiss. Salis um, and Spinrad, I think, are the only two Americans who really did Cornelius stories. And Times Hammer is a great look at the growth of an experimental writer in his youth toward becoming an important genre novelist by the sort of early 90s, end of the 80s, early 90s, he started to really hit his stride. So that's worth looking out for. And um, if you're in the States, you can pick up a few last words. That focuses more on the SF stories. James Salas, great experimental writer, a pure and rarefied thing, as I say. Really, really good. Just as an aside, um, this is something James Salas did. You can pick this up fairly easily. A great anthology called The War Book. And um, this is a pantomime. He did this way, way back. 
and late 60s early 70s and this is why the Vietnam War was going on and let's see 69 there's such great stuff in this there's um, Algis Budris Donald Bartelme who's a mainstream writer who sort of experimented with fabulation is really interesting there's people like Fritz Lieber and Norman Spinrad Mac Reynolds the great American socialist SF writer Salas himself the great humorist and noir writer Frederick Brown Henry Kettner you know this goes right across the spectrum and it's all really great stuff as well as all stories about war so try and pick one up it's not too difficult to find it's fantastic Roger Selassny a writer who I find frustrating because as so many writers he started really amazingly well and then seemed to go into a long slow decline and at his best he's just marvelous I remember the first time I read his story A Rose for Ecclesiastes which is just stunning poetic evocation of the planet Mars and it owes as much to say the pulp of C.L. Moore as it does to the sort of blissed out psychedelic aspects of the new wave and this is um, a Eastern Press leather bound edition of This Immortal, aka And Call Me Conrad. And this is his first novel and uh, one of my favourites by Zelazny and the one that I'm going to focus on today. Within two weeks of making this video and it going up, there'll be a new Best of Roger Zelazny coming from Golag's Masterworks, which I urge you to buy. It has the complete novel Damnation Alley in it, which is a really good little novel. Initially, I didn't like it, but it's grown to me a lot. And it has that story I mentioned and lots of other great things. And this is sort of like set centuries after a three day war. And there's a ruined earth, which is largely uninhabited. And it's reduced to a tourist spot for these alien aliens called the Vegans, who are humanoids. And they're kind of quietly oppressing mankind simply by being his cultural superiors. And while many people who are left over elect to live off the planet they've all moved to um, Titan the moon of Saturn or other more distant worlds and they are content to accept the kind of intellectual hegemony of Vega but the titular character of this Conrad Conrad Nomikos who's Greek I seem to recall is one of the minority who remains at home he's tall he's got a club foot he has a face which is blighted by a fungal growth and he contracted that radioactive hot spot and the hot spots like that come up in Ellison's A Boy and His Dog as well, very memorably, the burn pit screamers. And he's he sort of works as the arts commissioner for planet Earth and he's rediscovering, digging up and curating the remnants of our once glorious history pre-Holocaust. And he's sort of wryly spoken and ironically mannered and he's hiding something and but a few people have begun to suspect it he's as lethal in combat as he is erudite he is a greek aesthete he's a mutant and he's several hundred years old hence the title this immortal or and call me conrad and it has a kind of feel in some ways of herman melville i think as well i really, really felt that when i read it and nomikos he has to sort of go on a journey with the vegan's greatest living writer a character called mish taigo and they tour the mediterranean gosh i could do with that now and it's sort of like something's going to come out of this and Conrad has this feeling there's going to be more than a guidebook for the aliens and he thinks that Mishtai is going to pen a survey, a survey of Earth and reinforce his parochial status as a traveller's curiosity, silencing the handful of dissenting Terrans who dream of restoring Earth to its former glory really. So Nomicus understands though that merely assassinating Mish Tiger won't sort of really serve the cause and he has to do something else and covertly over the centuries he's been working towards bringing man back to earth and reclaiming their birthright and that some sort of subtlety is going to be needed. It's one of Salazny's shorter novels, I like short novels, he did a lot of short novels. Um, he sort of got into sequel things later on with Amber and you know it's the ideal place to restart reading him I think you know he's singular sort of writer really he's informed witty he understands mythological archetypes this comes out a lot in Lord of Light a more famous book which is more pantheistic and I'm not so keen on Lord of, Lord of Light I like it but I think this is sharper and more stringent and it's more like having you know you sort of just walked to a bar and it's hot outside and you just need you, you get the hit off the first short you have a vodka and tonic or you know a Jack Daniels and coke with ice and the lemon is in the in the vodka no lemon in the coke and you know you you take a sip of it and it hits home and you breathe out and it's there and that's what this book is like you know it's not like sort of having 10 pints it's like having one really good short that sort of brings you around and refocuses you and relaxes you it's very much in that way of things and it, he sort of uses the sort of Helen 
minimalistic classical setting to a wonderful advantage and it's elegant and flavoursome and it's representative of the way Zelazny comes in at oblique angles. He's got a concise edgy quality which is often absent in works which employ styles which are ornate as his. I don't find that so much in people like say R.A. Lafferty. He's not a floppy writer. He is he sort of takes you in at a certain angle and it cuts through and the meat parts and you see the blood and the skull beneath the skin. It's very, very much there. And he has very poetic moments which are really sort of flowery and beautiful. And, you know, he really is quite important, you know. And the, the poetic side became more pronounced later in the 70s. And he was a blinding light to the new wave, you know. He was really sort of highly regarded and he collaborated rather unsuccessfully I feel with people like Alfred Best and Philip K. Dick and although you know his, 90, his 60s work is the best he died quite young in 1995 I think he's only about 60 but you know he is one of the most amazing eminences of the school of fantastic writing and you know the dream masters another great book by him as well he who shapes was the story and yeah eastern press they're lovely books you know they, they don't do much good stuff now they lots of great stuff then you can't get them easily in the states gilt edged illustrated you know i really recommend you pick some up um i love them i've got a few i'd like a lot more but the problem is the postage from the usa so that's roger Salazny, this immortal and call me conrad this is somebody i talk about on the channel a lot and they're cardinally important i think they're the most important american science fiction writer after philip k dick i think the strange thing about this writer is their longevity and the success of their career in all sorts of ways. He's actually worked against him as a cult figure. I mean, Philip K. Dick obviously a very dramatic life. He died very young. There's the film, which made all the difference. I don't care what anybody says. But this guy, um, I think, is really important. But the longevity, in a way, has kind of worked against his critical cachet. And that's Robert Silverberg. Silverberg came up in the 50s. He was, by his own admission, pretty much a hack writer. He wrote SF. Um, he wrote softcore porn. He wrote crime and he did really well you know he was a precocious kid and he and Alison lived in the same sort of block together at one point and you know he won a Hugo early on and he made lots and lots of money and then when the magazine market collapsed he stepped away from SF he wrote a lot of non-fiction books some which are very erudite and really good and he returned to SF in the late 60s and started doing his keynote work from about 68 till about um, 75, 76. And this is one of his most important books. It's, I may, I, I'm focusing on this one because this isn't the most new wave one, but it does show really what the new wave was trying to do in terms of bringing SF and the mainstream together and trying to get people to take it seriously. Because that's the thing, people still don't take SF seriously. And that's because the quality of the writing and the lack of ambition and the failure to address tragedy and caritas, as Norman Spinrad says. And really, and this is Down to the Earth, which everybody knows is a kind of Roman Clef in a way of Silverberg's spiritual development. It's also a cover version of Heart of Darkness by Conrad, which of course was filmed as Apocalypse Now. And it's about a man who once worked for Earth's sort of colonialist intergalactic sort of empire. And he goes back to a planet where he worked, where he feels he's wrong to the two symbiotic species who lived there. And the one species resemble elephants and the other resemble baboons in a sort of broad sense. And he goes back on this Hagira, this journey, through this sort of tropical landscape in search of repentance and rebirth and it's a very religious feeling book and spirituality was an important thing in the 60s you know people looked at alternative belief and it was regarded as flaky then and now it's you know virtually the mainstream and you know the four Silverberg themes I always mention power transcendence transformation redemption are all in here and it's very very beautiful um, and you know he's a consummate professional and this is a book that you go through and you see that character as I say, repenting, you know, wishing that he hadn't been involved in the exploitation of the natives and, and trying to sort of make good with them. And he participates in their sort of cultural rituals. And it's a very wise and beautiful book. It's the sort of thing that Ursula Le Guin almost certainly loved. But Silverberg, he has an edge. He has a sharpness, a silvery tone, a coolness. And, you know, he's a real intellectual and not 
of the sort of beetle brown difficult to understand you get to the heart of it the viscera the mind and the body come together and flower into a wonderful psychedelic melange and that's in all his great work and downward to the earth it's interesting because he's going down to another planet but it is that thing about man reconnecting with nature in the broader sense on the other side of the universe and it's very beautiful and i've mentioned this one because on the channel i'm working through my favorite civil bird books there's one more i want to really sort of focus on um matt at bookfield did a great review of this by the way um if you, if you haven't seen that do check it out and it's marvelous and this is a golang's yellow jacket first edition um fantastic and I think one day somebody at some point in the mainstream will read one of the great books and will write an article about it in the right paper magazine and people will suddenly discover this guy. Silver quit writing um, for about four years because he got fed up of producing these amazing books which won a couple of awards, not as many as he liked. His best new age stuff is probably the experimental short stories at that time. There are loads of good story collections, loads of things I could have picked on. But this really shows that the ambition of the mainstream of literature coming into America and SF and doing truly, truly beautiful and, and spiritually enlightening things. And really he quit in disgust, rather like Barry Marsberg did, we'll come on to that. And he didn't produce anything for several years because he was a pro, because he'd had a period where he was doing hack work and making lots of money. And, you know, do read his autobiographical writings. They are sublime. He returned with a book called Lords about Lord Valentine's Castle, which is a big fantasy novel, set in another planet, but it is a fantasy novel, because there's magic in it, and several sequels to that. And you know, and he made lots of money with it. And there's something, his books then have been stately and magnificent and consummately written. He's so good, you know, smooth, and but they have missed something. And there is a feeling that the rawness and the intensity of the sort of 68 to 76 work was too much for some people. And I think it really hurt him, it really hurt him, but because he's a pro, because he's always been a writer, he can just turn it on. And you know, he's an old guy now, and you know, we're lucky to still have him. And I met him once very briefly, and I hadn't fully fallen under his spell then, even though I'd read a few of his books. But I rediscovered Robert the big way about 20 years ago, and he's just so amazing. He just really, really is. Get out there and read his stuff, it's really important. So that's sort of the you know, he was somebody who started in the early days. I mean, a lot of his early 60s books, here's one. This is To Live Again, which is a Sidgwick first edition hardcover. Um, I got this recently from John, Jonathan, at Sci-Fi Scavenger. Do watch John's channel. Hi, John, I hope you're watching. And um, I bought this from John, after he showed him one of his videos on his hauls. And he bought a book from me, funnily enough, an Ian McDonald book. And I sent him my paperback of this as I want him to read it. And we're going to do an interview probably on his channel soon, so do watch out for that. But even some of the early 60s ones, like this one, To Live Again, this kind of a life trilogy, Master of Life and Death, To Live Again and Recall to Life. They're all really, really good. You know, they're really, really good books. So do check them out. Watch out for them. We go to another obscure figure, somebody who nobody talks about. Um, somebody with huge acclaim. And this is, again probably one of the more experimental of the new wave sort of writers from the USA and this is Modoran by David Bench in the NYRB classics imprint New York Review Books classics and they do a number of SF novels their books are absolutely beautiful as you can see and I'm going to do a feature just about them at some point and um, David Bench is quite a mysterious figure um, he does sort of pop up in the magazines at times I don't think anybody knows his birth date or anything I, I couldn't find it anyway maybe I should dig deeper but um, Modoran is really, it's really hard to describe. It's, this was the first reissue, and there was, a, there was an edition back in the 70s, and I had that, quite hard to find. And this one is a more recent reissue, and this is in print now. And Modoran is a world where nuclear holocaust has sort of pretty much destroyed everything. Everything's covered in plastic, the ground's covered in plastic, and people have had to become cyborgs to survive. They're gradually replacing their body parts with machinery. So they're androids, so they're, they're moving towards robot robots. So it reminds you of the Cybermen from Doctor Who. It's about the same time they appeared. It's the same time the Modran story started appearing. And they appeared here and there, and there's no novels, and there's a lot of them. And what you get in this is an unsettling chorus of polyphonic voices. These individuals who are gradually replacing their bits with machinery. 
and they're kind of striving for a utopian apotheosis where everything is magnificent and everything's sublime and everybody's merged into a perfect sort of society but they're kind of hamstrung by existential hollowness and it's uncompromising and intense but critically acclaimed but never popular and never much loved it in some ways reminds me of brave new world in some ways it reminds me of limbo limbo 90 by bernard wolf it's a very strange book um there's certain affinities with dg compton's work um you know they, the characters really are trying to put on this brave face of how they have this wonderful utopian society now and everything is great and you know as they replace their their sort of human parts and machinery they're approaching this wonderful sort of state of consciousness but it's actually quite horrible and you know they are becoming detached from society and retreating into solipsism and it's a metaphor really for the way that a lot of experimental writers felt about the modern world and how people were sort of becoming disconnected from reality because of the size of the mass media and that's even more true now so Motoran in a way is probably more relevant as we mo move towards a post-human age and if you like things about post-humanism um, sort of jacking into machinery AI consciousness you know the rapture of the nerds all those things Motoran's a really really important book and it's beautifully written it's not for everybody you have to take it in stages a story at a time take a breath and think about it but it really is quite profound and unsettling and uh, it's a few things from NYRB getting to you know getting to NYRB is what I'm just trying to say and la it's a weird thing because of course a lot of critics in the mainstream they haven't read much SF so occasionally they'll read something which is you know which is good but they'll think it's amazing and they don't realize it's one of hundreds of things like that um, this isn't like that this really is quite unique but you do get the feeling that if the people at NYRB read a bit more widely and could get the rights to things that they would have an immense science fiction list they've got a great one it's full of really good stuff but you get the feeling that they probably go a bit further and they do lots of literary fantasy which is great as well so i've shown some of the channel there will be more this has got an introduction by jeff vandermeer which is excellent um i like jeff vandermeer in theory more than in practice but he he's his heart's in the right place and uh, modoran really really good you know some of the stories did pop up they popped up in science fiction magazines they pop in the most unusual places you know they pop up in something like amazing or something weird like that so so that's a great one to have a look at so that's moved around then we move on to another short story collection by one of my favorite writers who i cannot say enough good about and he's famous he's going to be more famous soon because one of his novels um, probably his most accessible and best novel in terms of pure sf is being adapted by Neil Gaiman for Amazon Prime, I think, and that's Nova, the space opera, to end all space operas. And soon I'm going to be doing a video about space opera because normally I hate space opera, but the things I like, I really like. So it's going to be my space opera favourites. So watch out for that. I'm going to do some more rereading and research for that because a few things I know straight away, another few things I need to think about. But we're talking about Samuel R. Delaney and this is his collection I and Gomorrah which of course is a biblical quotation from Genesis it's about the moment when the cities of the plain Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by a wrathful God and Lot and his daughters escaped his wife turned around and was reduced to a pillar of salt and is seen as a kind of metaphor for the nuclear situation in some sort of way and I and Gomorrah is the is one of my favorite stories um, there's earlier Delaney collections, there's one called Drift Glass and one called Shatter Shards. There was an edition they both together. This is selections from both and some other things. This is published by Vintage USA and Vintage do about six of these. Absolutely beautiful. Really beautiful and lovely, lovely trade paperbacks. As you can see, that's absolutely gorgeous. And all I can say about this is that Delaney, of course, is a man of colour, um, bisexual, great pro stylist, wrote his first novel, The Jewels of Atom, when he was very young quest narratives heroes high color the grail is quite the thing with delaney where there's there's a plot coupon that needs to be captured and there's something you know he is like zelazny zelazny was another new waiver from that period where there's you know the style the beauty of the writing is just there the flow the shape the tones it's all there And there's a kind of airiness to Delaney's work. I always find myself getting really blissed out when I read him, even when there's fast, intense action or violence, because even in the pain, even in the exquisite agony that comes out of his book sometimes, there's a 
this rawness but it's refined and the two things are perfectly balanced and the person who reminds me the most is Jean Genet the French um, gay writer who was a thief um, who wrote very very passionately about about sort of being gay and living the life um, on the edge on the outside and Jenny is coming back into fashion now which is really really good and Jenny also wrote about the bestowing virtue that Nietzsche called it where you turn your weakness the thing that people hate about you that society hates about you into your strength and to be proud of, of it and, 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 and Delaney does that but you know, in a very sort of quiet way you know and that's that's the strength of it so he meshes pulp, pulp SF tropes with high art and there's several stories you know, the star pit is wonderful opens to the beautiful beach sequence and there's other things you know this goes across his career but there are famous things like um time considered as a helix of semi-precious stones and we in some strange powers employ move on a rigorous line cage of brass and then there's later stuff dog in the fisherman's net is fantastic but i'll just talk about the title story i and Camorra. um I've read it so many times, I always go back to it, and it's wistful and sad and strange and shocking. It posits a future in which people are in space, but as we're discovering, there's all this talk about Elon Musk or whoever, sending people to Mars, is it going to be female, is it going to be this? It's going to be a lot tougher than people realise. You get calcium loss and all sorts of things, you know, and nobody's done it yet. So basically, the people who go into space to work on satellites and space stations and what have you, they all altered they all have to be surgically altered so they can live in space and something that happens in this is that the people who go into space and live there are neuters no matter how they begin whether they're male or female um, they have to have their gonads their reproductive internal organs taken away from them their testes or their ovaries taken away so they have no sex they're indeterminate and it's a narrative from one of them and they come on shore leave down to earth and they behave badly they break windows they go from one city to another they go back up into space for a few shifts back to earth and this is set i believe i think it's in paris and it's a narrative where they a strange cult has formed around them and it's kind of predatory but kind of wistful and painful as well there are people who love the spaces despite or possibly possibly even because of their indeterminate gender and there are comments in this on science fiction itself and the pornography of science fiction and the obsessive nature of SF and the tropes that we love like the astronaut of course was the primary sort of figure the spaceman the heroic spaceman is the primary figure of pulp SF in the golden age and onwards and even now you know it's an important sort of thing and Delaney sort of undermines that in this but celebrates it at the same time and it's extremely beautiful he also describes it as a horror story because it's about what can and what cannot be fulfilled so you really should read it i and gomorrah and of course anything with a biblical reference tends to gain power straight away and you know maybe you shouldn't look back or you'll turn into that pillar of salt delaney magnificent There's also an anti Oedipus Press edition of this, which I don't have, with a forward by my friend, the novelist James Rice, who used to work with me. And this is the third book, Revelations. Which has an amazing um, introduction by D. Harlan Wilson. And they're a thematic trilogy. There are some links. And the basic idea of this is what Miles Big wanted to get across, is that he was disgusted in the way that the space race had been used politically you know the cold war thing and then the way it had seemed to be used to distract people's attention from the vietnam war and the vietnam war went on until 74 and the space program sort of wound down and people were over it really quickly you know the sense of wonder wasn't there and already people like ballard had been very very dismissive and cynical about the way things had gone and these are very angry books and they show men in space and extreme sort of stress not just from the fact that you know it's very dangerous nobody's done it before but the fact they're not really piloting the machines at all it's all done by computers and they're just there as figureheads for the media and they try and expose what really goes on there's multi-layered things there's instances maybe of schizophrenia and homosexuality in this one the falling astronauts takes it even further and the trilogy magnificently sort of mounts and racks up 
with Revelations, which is where an ex-astronaut who's been cast aside tries to get onto this reality TV program, which is sort of like a Bug Jack Barron style expose where people can say what they like, but the the narrator, the um, host of the show, really does sort of stick the needle in them and absolutely marvellous. The SF content of this one is minimal. It is the apotheosis of the trilogy and they are absolutely fantastic. They're bitter, they're dark, they're short, they're sharp. They're full of erotic content. Marsberg wrote erotic novels which were as unsettlingly existentially dark as they were sexy. But they weren't sexy at all. In Barry's books people are always having sex but they never enjoy it. It's always grim and joyless and, <laughs> and gritty and horrible and he wrote all sorts of things and he quit for a long time and he's been writing slowly and steadily since the um, since the early 80s short stories what have you and there's a lot of him on the channel but these really sort of upset people they upset the old guard um, but in needed doing but people like Ellison and Silverberg said you know this guy got it you know he's the greatest and for me he's like Ionesco or Camus you know and he is depressing you know let's be honest he is a depressing writer but I find him extremely bracing and he lifts you up through the grimness to talk about the potential of the human spirit which isn't always fulfilled and that's the thing in New Wave it's about people people always get you down as the Hawkwind song says so you know it is magnificent stuff so he takes those things turns them on their head and he upsets the golden dream of space travel which if you really know the facts began slave labor camps in Nazi Germany and in you know the um, behind the iron curtain you know the darkness behind the dream the William S Burroughs thing about how America is built on a lie is sort of in these but you know he wants hope but it's dragged down by the military industrial media complex who are attacked savagely in these fantastic stuff. So that's the Paranoid Astronaut Trilogy by Barry N. Malzberg. And as I say, if you can get these anti-Oedipus editions, the introductions, oh, they're so, I am actually in awe. I am sort of envious of how good the writers are. They are fantastic. And it's the sort of thing I'd like to be writing myself if I could find the time and the energy. Um, really great criticism, put them into context and, and you will learn and appreciate so much. So full kudos to D. Holland Wilson, James Reich and the chap who did the introduction of this, I don't know him, and Berta Rossi and it's really, really quite something. So do pick those up, magnificent work. Moving on, um, Norman Spinrad. Well, Norman, I love Norman and um, I met him once at the World Con People have said to me, you're going to Paris soon. Why don't you try and meet up with Norman? He lives in Paris. This is The Iron Dream, which is a book. Um, it's an easy win, really. I could have picked something else, but I went for this because I haven't talked about it. And as you see, it's got a great cover. Nearly every cover The Iron Dream's ever had is great. Um, and this is Norman's look at the psychosexual tendencies, the neuroses and the fascism that is lying beneath the surface of sword and sorcery and sort of typical heroic square jawed manifest destiny American SF and fantasy and even some of the UK stuff as well. It's also an alternate history which is really clever. The basic idea of the Iron Dream is that Hitler instead after a little sort of dabble with right wing politics which doesn't come together and of course it didn't initially for him there was the failed putsch and all that stuff he decides to move to America where he becomes a pub SF writer and he writes a novel called The Lord of the Swastika. So when you open this book, it begins with the Iron Dream on the title page, then you turn it over and it then tells you all about Adolf Hitler, who was recognized as one of the most popular science fiction novelists by fans and he won a Hugo Award in 1954. And then you turn another page over and it tells you all about the author and you get Lord of the Swastika, a science fiction novel by Adolf Hitler. And Norman wrote this in deliberately pulpy, lurid, lowest common denominator language to get the message across. He was parodying it, he was attacking it. And he was saying, this is what's been underlying a lot of golden age SF and traditional SF since the 1930s. You know, this racist, sexist, fascist garbage that's out there. And, you know, I'm gonna sort of attack it. I'm gonna take it to pieces. And um, there's a character in this called Ferret Yagar, 
who has the truncheon of Held, which is a large phallic club, and he lives in a post-nuclear world where you know there's lots of mutants, the dominators of Zind, and make no mistake, they are stand-ins for the Jews, and this is sort of like he's sort of anti-Semitic, so it's Hitler's anti-Semitism. Hitler's anti-Semitism turned into metaphor with the dominators of Zin to a telepathic and wily need to be undermined by the pure-blooded Aryans. And it doesn't hold anything back. It's also very funny as well. Once you see who he's poking at, and if you know if you're a Heinlein hater, you'd love this. And it's really good. And Harry Harrison said, if Wagner wrote SF, this is how he would do it. So at the same time, he's got that rousing, you know, sort of American Eagle type thing. It's got the Weimar Eagle type thing. So it's a real mixed bag. It's quite uncomfortable in places. It's great fun. And um, I think it's out of print. There was a point it was going to be a masterwork. Is it a controversial book? Not for anybody with a brain in their head. But it's a good one to read alongside The Man in the High Castle and Dick and Spin Rattle Mates. And, you know, it's, um, <laughs> it's about the same thing, but in a different way and possibly more pointed towards criticism of SF itself. So that's the Iron Treatment. Norman, Norman is sort of like, um, a guy who really cares about things. He's a very warm human being. And I was reading a post he made on social media about you. When you see somebody in trouble, you just help. You know, you don't make an issue of it. You just you just go and help. And, you know, and, and people think he's this fierce, foaming, rabid, you know, new wave guy, you know. And he does remind me of Norman Mailer, the great sort of um, pugnacious, American writer and journalist and uh, he's very much in that thing. He's a polemical writer. He's somebody who cares passionately and he's really heartfelt and the person I would say who I spoke about recently in my cyberpunk video who Norman reminds me of the most it, or the other way around is really um, John Shirley. John Shirley's got that sort of beating heart as well and Norman's done some books where he shows he really cares and he says that you know eventually all isms become fascism you know and just sort of have some common decent basic humanity and you know and, and he's he's angry about it and he's fierce about it so you know he's not a wishy-washy guy you know he, he, he puts it up he's not going to sort of garland you with flowers he's going to say look this is the way it is you've got to confront this stuff so you know he's got the spirit really great stuff And as I say, he came to the UK and um, the bug Jack Barron, his novel was, was serialized in New Worlds and that caused another thing which we talked about in the other video. Somebody else who came to the UK and who, you know, produced wonderful work. And whenever I read him, I don't read him much these days, but I, I am revisiting him. I'm just astonished by how good he is. And I knew he was good when I first read him when I was much younger. And that's Thomas N. Dish. This is 334. Now, this is a classic example of the heavily inappropriate book cover. It's a science fiction novel. What do we do? We stick a spaceship on the cover. I love it. We all love a spaceship on the cover. We like it. However, this is really nothing to do with spaceships. 334 is a collection of linked novellas, some of which were published in magazines and anthologies. And they're set in New York in 2021. Of course, that's two years ago now. But you imagine um, when these were written, it was like 50 years off. And it's 334 refers to two things 334 is like a tower block a con act social housing and it's about the people who live in 334 and they're mostly downtrodden they haven't got any money and welfare state sort of thing and it's really sort of shows how the welfare state can be a good thing and a bad thing because in a way they never break out of it they're over supported in some ways not in others but you see social change you know there are people who there's a great story where about a married couple and he is gradually becoming more feminine and she's becoming more masculine and that's a really great story and it's warm and it's funny and it's about sort of changes in gender roles so it's like decades ahead you know really is and I reread it the other night in an anthology that particular story and it's absolutely fantastic and it opens with another wonderful tale um, called The Death of Socrates where there's these kids um, attending lectures about the classics and they are, uh, you know, they're sort of attention deficit and they're wandering and they haven't got mobile phones, you know, because the mobile phone was something the most SF writers didn't work out. And it's, you, know, you think, how can people ever get out of the morass they're in? So it's real social commentary and it's funny and warm and humane. Um, and it doesn't pull any punches on the sex stuff, you know, it really doesn't. And um, this is a first edition of 334, um, which I got on a book hunt. That's a video on that channel. And 
you know, Dish, his most famous book is probably Camp Concentration, which is really good, which is about an intellectual imprisoned in the future who's given an experimental drug to suppress him. And it actually increases his intelligence, but at the same time, it gives him a terrible disease. The Genocides was his breakthrough novel, which is an alien invention, an alien invasion novel, excuse me, an alien invasion novel with a difference, which <laughs> it does upset some people. I loved it. And, um, you know, Dish is very mordant and funny and black. As Scott Bradfield always says in his channel, you know, he hated the Catholic Church, hated organised religion. And Tom was gay. He was going to do a collaborative novel with Chris Priest, which never happened. He did one with his partner, Charles Naylor. And, you know, he he was loathed by the science fiction establishment. He never won many awards. You know, he was looked at at this guy who was slumming it, who was really a mainstream writer. You know, and they really didn't like him. And you suspect there was homophobia as well from the old school guys in some cases. But he's absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Utopian novel with a difference. Came to a very sad end. He lived in a rent controlled apartment in New York. Um, and even though he wrote The Brave Little Toaster, which American audiences will know as an animated film, it's an obscure book in the UK kids book and a sequel. He did all sorts of different sorts of writing, some great horror novels, which are very funny at times. He came to a sad end, as I say, rent controlled apartment in New York. His partner died and he couldn't afford to pay the rent. And he shot himself in the stomach, you know, and it's other that he was always there for tragedy. You know, it was it was one of his things and um, great critic as well. Really important. So Tom Dish. Um, you know, three, three, four, great stuff. Maybe not the place to start. Read the genocides if you haven't read anything else. And then the ending of that will really decide you on whether you're ready to sort of dive into this oeuvre. Fantastic stuff. But if only 10% more of genre SF was well written as Dish's works, we'd absolutely be in clover. Believe you me, he really was quite special. Fantastic. Great shame in a way that he didn't concentrate on a mainstream career because I think he did done really well. You know, but the funny thing is, there's a lot of science fiction writers of this kind. They sold more books than equivalent mainstream writers. So there you go. Not the acclaim, but they got the sales. So that's the thing. But he wasn't enough for Tom. Harlan Ellison, as I said, edited um, Dangerous Visions. Um, but he was more than just a great editor. You know, Harlan was a great writer in himself. And this is um, Death of Stories from the mid 70s. Um, with This is the first edition from Harper and Bro, I think it is. Half and with a cover by Leo and Diane Dillon, who did the wonderful A Specials covers. Uh, isn't that beautiful? And Ellison, um, I, I, <laughs> I find it hard to be objective about him in as much as he was difficult with lots of people. This, I think, is my second favourite collection by him. The f my most, most favourite is The Beast of Shadow Love of the Heart of the World. This is the more new wavy stuff. Even though this wasn't collected till the mid 70s, these stories leached out late 60s, early 70s. And there are simply deathless things in this. And there's a lot of cruelty and anger and fierceness in this work. I'm just going to take it out the wrap just to have a look and remind myself of what we've got. Um, lovely purple cloth with a deckled edge. Great stuff. Let's see. When I first read this book, there's this caveat lector on the uh, Beyond the Title page. It is suggested that the reader not attempt to read this book at one sitting. The emotional content of these stories, taken without break, may be extremely upsetting. This note is intended most sincerely and not as hyperbole. Ah, ah, of course, it was hyperbole, but these are really, really powerful stories. They're fantastic. Begins with an introduction called Ablations at Alien Altars. That's the sort of thing Harlan was great at. And then it opens with the incredibly dark story, The Whimper of Whipped Dogs which is based on the murder case in New York of Kitty Genovese, who was a woman who was killed um, in like the courtyard of her apartment building. And while people watched from the window, she was stabbed to death. Um, it's based around that and it's really, really powerful. It's an interesting thing because some of, if you look into the case, some of the claims have been made have been dismissed, but it is worth with Kitty Genovese. Look it up, it's worth knowing about. And Ellison really was angry about this. So this well, how can people just stand in their window and watch as somebody is murdered? You know, it's a terrible thing. Then there's along the scenic route, which is Mad Max. It's like Mad Max, except it's better. Cars in the future. And there's gladiatorial battles between drivers. And it's just rocks. It is so cool. It's pure pedal to the metal if this goes on. So if you like things like Code 3, Mad Max, the Road Warrior, um, Roger Zelazny's 
um, Damnation Alley, that sort of thing. On the downhill side, wonderful elegiac fantasy, neon, very funny. Um, you'll find that I'll say exactly the same things about this in my Allison thing. Because neon is about a, a, it's about sort of people who are outside is getting together. They've all got different disabilities, and there's one, one part where somebody talks about somebody who's erotically interested in um, balloons and helicopters, and it's just screamingly funny. And Shatter Like a Glass Goblin, the great anti-drug story. Um, really, really marvellous. And The Death Bird, which, you know, Ellison is trying to cope with the death of his dog. And it's like written like a school essay, but it's from different angles and it's experimental. And just marvellous, you know. So this is, I mean, Ellison for me is, you know, the, in some ways the definitive American New Wave writer. Because what he had, in lots of ways... He did experimental stuff. He wasn't always that literary. He could be straight ahead and direct, but he had the attitude. And that attitude fed through New Wave into cyberpunk and into everything that's beyond that. And Ellison's underrated in that way. And that's because he didn't really write novels very much and he didn't write full-blown SF novels so nobody knows who he is. And he was so awkward with his publishers that they just, you know, they all end up dropping in the end. And throughout the 80s, you see limited editions, trade paperbacks, you get in the 90s and his name really disappears but you know he was very decorated made lots of money incredible character his house in LA is just astonishing the pictures you see and the stories you hear and it's going to be opened up as a museum I want to go just to go to that house so that's deathbed stories don't read it in one sitting because it's too long savor it roll it over the eyeballs enjoy it um, and you know it is really it was my second Allison collection I think and it's, it's a great one to go for so we've got to bag that later uh, beautiful and I, am I an Allison complete it's pretty much really um, but once a year I'll go online I'll find an Allison hardback I don't have and I buy it and it's always a great pleasure to revisit him so there we go so the sum up the American New Wave is best considered by looking at the writers who were most allied in most cases to the UK New World School which is why some of these people have come up in my other videos it's why they came up in the previous New Wave video and why I pretty much ignored a lot of the people in Dangerous Visions because Dangerous Visions was the commercial and award sort of winning basis and locus of what happened in terms of trying to make the New Wave a thing and the New Wave gets talked about and it lasts kind of longer I mean you know, if you look at a lot of critical things, they say the new wave fizzled out, that it was a small thing. But really, the new wave changed everything. It changed everything in British SF and American SF. There was less to change in British SF because it always had, there was always a tradition of science fiction in the mainstream from people like Wells, Orwell, Huxley, any other number of writers you can name. I mean, Ford Maddox Ford wrote a science fiction novel. You know, it's, it's all out there. And in, in the States, it was different. And literary SF in the States was different, but it really allowed people like Spinrad, like Silverberg, Allison, Farmer, Dish, you know, to really sort of break out and do things which had more seriousness and they want to expand and grow as writers. And in the UK, by the end of the 70s, New Wave was dominant and it dominated for several years until the space opera renaissance started by Ian M. Banks, which we won't go into. So, you know, it's a really important thing in terms of raising the bar. Throughout the 70s and early 80s, we saw the advanced literary techniques of New Wave merging with hard SF in the work of people like Gregory Benford, really good writer, who said, you know, if you were doing if you were doing hard SF, you were playing tennis with a net down. But Gregory was willing to go the other way as well. So he was just one example of people like Michael Bishop, who started doing standard flavoursome tropes and in the 80s did wonderful humanist novels. And we're going to talk about 80s American SF soon. I'm very aware that we haven't really talked about female writers very much and there's historical reasons for that i'm going to address that in an impositions video soon and i did consider putting some female writers into this primarily joanna russ but i think they really need to be considered separately and to be looked at in their own right so that will be something we'll address later on so this is outlaw books i hope you enjoyed that there'll be more new wave to come this is a great collection by norman if you want to you want to try and find it this is easy to get in the states there's also an anthology called the new tomorrows which is really good really good new wave anthology i mentioned that in the other video so you know do give some of the new wave stuff a try if you're a british reader not used to the american new wave you will find it's a bit more straight ahead but it's got lots of muscle and fire and feel and verve it's sinewy and dark and full of life exploding with pyrotechnics bye for now and the americans who came over included people like thomas m dish jim salis <laughs> there we go <laughs> ted cameo